Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Training Tidbits podcast series. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge from Animal Training Academy. And as always, I'm very excited to be inviting another Animal Training Academy member and positive reinforcement practitioner onto the show today to talk all things best practice when it comes to managing our animals and understanding their behavior. I'm really excited about the caliber of guests that we have for you today. Not only is it someone that is going to be able to seamlessly tick all of the boxes regarding the goals of this podcast, which are to educate entertain and inspire you but it's also a very dear friend of mine someone who was with me right from the start of my career and played a crucial role in aligning my compass and putting me on the positive reinforcement train i'm very excited to announce today we are talking to one mr nick bishop nick is a human animal fascinated with learning behavior and the art of storytelling he has worked in the zoo world for the past 20 years in australia and overseas with a keen focus on birds and free flight presentations these have been blended with his background as an actor slash singer to see him work internationally in the field of nature theatre and free flight shows in Australia, the Middle East and the USA. His local career history includes stints at Zoo South Australia, Taronga Conservation Society and Alice Springs Desert Park, as well as establishing a learning group called Behaviour Techs. Other pursuits include natural history illustration and cartooning and storytelling as an actor slash singer in the Adelaide theatre scene. He is currently the manager of Nature Theatres at Zoo South Australia and in my personal opinion, doing a magnificent job there. It's my <laughs> tremendous pleasure to welcome you to the show today, Nick, how are you, mate? I'm fantastic. Thanks so much, Ryan. That is some rap. I was thinking a lot about what to say in that rap, and <laughs> I actually condensed it down quite significantly <laughs> from what I wrote at the start. There's lots I could say about you, my good friend, Nick. I'm, I'm very excited about this up-and-coming conversation, and let's dive straight in today. I was mm. wondering, Nick, if you could take us back and share with the audience how you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training and tell it, tell us about some of the first animals you ever trained using these techniques. Well, Ryan, I'll start answering that question by taking the last part of the question and making that first because I think some of the first animals I ever trained using these techniques were probably some of the first animals I ever met. And I remember being a child and receiving a yellow budgie for my fifth birthday from my auntie Beth. And was really thrilled with this bird. It had been identified by my family, both immediate and distant, that I was going to be a bit of a nature nut with a, a real bent for birds at an early age. And so she just decided she would give me this budgerigar. And I think that every time I fed that bird and it moved towards the feeding container, I was getting a sense that behavior is set up that way and that animals are definitely motivated and driven by their seeking systems. So her name was Bella and wherever she is, weaning her way Way around the ether out there right now. Thanks very much, Bella, for being my first teacher in that area. Then, of course, my parents, noticing this interest, uh, continue to furnish me with opportunities throughout my young life to have just experiences with birds, particularly budgerigars. And that's a passion that remains to this day. I keep and breed budgerigars right now and find them an endless source of amazing experience and tutelage in the fine arts of ABA just by watching them and then interacting with them. So probably my first positive reinforcement training experience was at that tender age with that little bird, unconscious as I was of the universality and the sort of pervasiveness of the science at the time. But when I first learned about positive reinforcement, it was also with parrots. And really it was at Adelaide Zoo when I was starting my career as a, a bird keeper in the late years of the 20th century. So it was really working with a cohort of friends with macaws at that stage and becoming aware of Natural Encounters, NEI and Steve Martin and reading books like Don't Shoot the Dog and gradually shaping awareness that there was some degree of framework, some formality, some structure around procedure. And as organic as it seems, as it plays out in the present moment, to learn that there was a scientific reveal behind it was for me galvanizing and totally engaging. So when I first started working with free flight birds, especially macaws, I started to do that research and started to learn practically for myself about the cause and effect nature of the organism's relationship with environment. And that went on then to furnish me with the platform to be able to move into a, a more elaborate system at the Taronga Free Flight Bird Show in 2004, where I worked for six years. And during that time, Taronga was generous enough to support various stints for me overseas, you know, in the Middle East and, and in the USA 
working in a whole range of diverse settings. And throughout that period, I was meeting people like Steve Martin, my dear friend Valda Stellard, our Susan Friedman, other people who remain really important to me here on home turf, a folk like uh, the one amazing Peter Clark of Animal Training Solutions in Sydney, who does a lot of amazing work with Dogs for Animal House, whose uh, training acumen is just breathtaking. And one of the things that she taught me was that training is a technical skill that you can actually learn. And one of my great concerns about the way we think about training and behavior is that there's still a degree of mystification or that sense of magical endowment about approach to animals and approach to nature. We run the risk in that area of actually, once again, doing what humans do so well, and that is to dividing by definition, becoming clannish, separating, saying there are people who have gifts and there are people who don't. Now, it's true that ability does range on a continuum. But when we talk about the haves or have nots in terms of the grasp of this technology and behavior and training skill, we are denying ourselves the ability to see ourselves as behaviors and therefore receiving the heritage that we all naturally have as living things, as human animals, as part of the glory that is the animal kingdom. So that's one of the major things that I discovered through working with people like Peter, with Valda, with Susan, with Steve, and many others of the fine trainers that I've worked with, Matt Kettle at Taronga, and the list goes on. All of them have taught me something about the natural world, our approach to it, and indeed my own place in it. That's a beautiful answer. And one reason it's beautiful, Nick, uh, and just take uh, and pleasure in this that a lot of people interact with Animal Training Academy and ask the question how can I get involved in animal training and I think there are so many gems hidden in that beautiful answer that you just gave that hopefully a lot of the audience can take away from it so thank you very much for that and I always think that there's such huge value in, in people sharing their stories on on this podcast and in doing so, sharing the lessons they learn along the way. We're going to talk about a lot of your great stories today, Nick. And one that really sticks out to me is your experience, and you mentioned it a couple of times already, traveling to the Middle East and <laughs> working with critically endangered Spix macaws. Nick, would you mind sharing your experience with the audience today about your work at the Al Wabra Wildlife Preservation Trust? And excuse me if I butchered the name of, <laughs> of that me if I was wrong. You're doing fine and indeed, you know, if you think that one was difficult, then get this one. I was actually working there for a guy called Sheikh Mohammed bin Ali Al Thani. And so uh, he was an amazing man, but probably amazing girl was my friendship with Ryan Watson, with who I'd worked in my early days at Zoo South Australia at Adelaide Zoo, who's one of the finest, most intuitive bird people I know, particularly when it comes to incubation and intensive hand raising of young birds. Just a true technician and an amazing guy. Now, he had worked with me at Adelaide Zoo and then had taken this position at Alwabra for the Sheikh, who has a large number of extraordinary animals on site at his preservation, which is about two and a half square kilometres in size. And it is a veritable oasis just sitting there in the sun-bleached savage desert of the Qatar Peninsula. And this place just held some of the rarest gems of nature that you could hope to see, but certainly stellar amongst them in that line of celebrities was the critically endangered Spixes macaw. Now, Ryan asked me there because they wanted to train a number of birds for get this nasal hormone supplement delivery. So we basically were asked to train them to present to then have the fluid put in their nares because there's just one cell walls layer in the nares, in the nostrils, just inside the sear that would enable the transmission of the fluid into the bloodstream of the bird and hopefully begin to have some kind of interface with the bird's hormone production. And the background on Spixus macaw is that, you know, it is one of the one of the great celebrity rarities of not only the parrot, but the entire bird world. And indeed, in the whole of nature conservation, it's a remarkable story that has so many different chapters to it. And indeed, Sheikh Saud's ambitions played a role in all of this, in that he had the ability to be able to purchase and successfully accommodate quite a number of the remaining Spixus macaws. And I was very excited to have 
have this opportunity. And interestingly, shortly before I left, and this was in the March, April of 2008, Ryan contacted me to say, for the 28-day visa period that you're going to be here in town, would you mind also training three of the Sheikh's Hyacinth Macaws for free flight around the central lawn area of the facility? So not only was I tasked with dealing with some, you know, six pairs of Spix's Macaws, but also tasked with this opportunity to train these Hyacinth Macaws. And I had very little idea of the caliber of the venture that I was about to embark on. So now I arrived in the desert and there was Ryan with his Brazilian wife, Mona, are waiting for me. And a dear friend of mine, Karen Cheek Justice, also came and joined us from uh, North Carolina. And then I met a German woman there, Nicole, who was also going to be working with us. So there was an American, an Australian and a German. So it's truly an international trio are working to train these birds for this procedure. And of course, the great interesting thing about it was that the birds had a range of individual histories. Some of them had been subjected to poaching, so were in no behavioural position to maintain any kind of trust account about people. Others had known people all their lives in the facility and had been treated a fair bit better. But you can imagine the challenge of dealing with a number of individuals with all of these different experiential and therefore learning backgrounds when it came to interface with humans. The challenge was how to get these birds to present and how to actually train them to hold their heads still long enough to get this tiny drop of fluid into a hole in the front of their head, no bigger than about 2.5 mil across. So what we did was set about with a training plan, remembering the laws of learning and our ABCs and having to start also with a degree of classical conditioning. Basically, we're going to rock up and we're going to feed you for not doing any particular target behavior, you know, just this stimulus, stimulus response kind of thing rolling in the first instance. And then gradually we're working to put more criteria on it and having the birds come forward into these feeding bays that had been very conveniently built into the facility. Each aviary was a generous space that had a walk-in section that was air-conditioned and had these protruding wire cages with slots to actually present food. So fortunately, as far as antecedent arrangement was concerned, we had that, that great opportunity to be able to immediately use and tailor the environment. And of course, that appeals, doesn't it? Because one of the exciting things about training is seeing what is available in the environment to help set us up for success. So we did this, we worked with these animals, and we had this great opportunity to develop behavior. And we were, for the most part, successful. And we were particularly successful with some individuals. And what we did was we taught them to come forward and to bite down on the end of one of those bamboo chopsticks. Do you know the ones that come as a twin pack and they're separated by snapping them apart. We found that that rectangular end of them just made the perfect device for the bird to actually bite and hold. So in the first instance, we had to teach them some duration on that. We had to then gradually, well, pretty much, with some it was more like habituating. They'd had quite a number of devices in their lives coming at them and they'd been approached with reasonable sensitivity. So they were pretty okay with objects around them, but some we had to definitely desensitize. And there was that delicate, that fine interplay between the request of the animal and the power of the reinforcers on offer to prevail in the circumstance. So there was a degree of of weight management for motivation here. And so what we did do when we finally got to that stage of training to get this liquid into the nares was we got together of an evening and I drew on a large sheet of paper many tiny circles about the same circumference as the nasal cavity of one of these parrots. And we would spend a lot of time with me at the table, moving the sheet of paper around whilst I was asking Nicole and Karen to put a droplet of liquid from the kind of syringe we would use onto one of these dots. Now, although I knew that we were planning to have 
a static head hole with therefore a still little nair to get the liquid into. I thought that was the best way for us to practice in the first instance, how to actually get the motor skills together to reach that target. That if we were able to do that, then our skills would be so much more together at dealing with hopefully an animal that was holding a whole lot more still than that moving piece of paper. And indeed, they would do that same procedure for me. So for me, that was placing the emphasis firmly on what Bob Bailey talks about a lot and chatted with me about when I was visiting him in the States in 2013. And that is training as a mechanical skill and getting your motor skills together around delivery is one of the most important things you can do. And what I think that we could see more of as training practitioners is all of us practicing that stuff away from the session, away from the animal and devising means to get our motor skills together to get the kind of targeted success that we're after. So we we had a varying degree of success with those birds. We certainly were able to teach some of them in the short period that we have. Shortly after that, the consulting vets working on the process decided to change their tack. But that was no problem for me because I felt we'd already benefited tremendously from working with these very, very beautiful very endearing birds. I just love that story. I, re- I love that story. And I think everyone can learn so much from that. So thanks for sharing that, Nick. It was great. <laughs> You're welcome. Hey, another topic I thought we could touch on today is, is something that you and I were talking about recently. And that was our experience going to events where animals are showcased. Agricultural fairs and shows from breeders, etc., dogs, rabbits, whatever it might be. And going to these fairs and viewing them through the lens of applied behavior analysis and learning theory. Can you expand on some of the observations you have made in those experiences? Yes, it's a really interesting area. I think for me, when I go to our Royal Adelaide show here in my hometown, over the last few years, I've begun to appreciate the variety of approaches to getting cooperative behavior, cooperative action from animals. And of course, in one fairly small area, such events are rich with opportunity to observe the full suite of human-animal interactions with other species. And I think of many examples of, of seeing a bull with a ring through its nose being led and with a long hook stick to also reach back and guide the rear forward and to adjust the legs. I see prize-winning highly skilled show jumping horses all having success with the use of bridles and what that pressure relationship means on the soft parts of the mouth. And basically, we, we do a lot of interactions with animals based on pressure and release. Basically, the application of positive punishment and its relationship with negative reinforcement. And one of the things that I've observed is actually applying positive punishment is a very common practice and it's absolutely instilled and accepted in the community. And here's the difficulty. If we wanted to discuss it, to address it, we would meet with a range of people who have a community reinforcement for behaving in this way towards animals. And I think that one of the things that it does is highlight to me really clearly that punishment is reinforcing for the punisher and spontaneously so. We know through looking at ABA that the contiguity of that consequence to the behavior is the thing that maintains or increases behavior, gets more of it in the future. And because those punishment techniques are so honored and so reinforced, it's very, very easy for people to continue to use them. And we can con ourselves into thinking that all is okay with an animal if we're getting what we want from it, irrespective of um, technique and response. And we are really reinforced by the animal's compliance. But occasionally you see horses that throw riders, you see cattle that break away for a variety of reasons. And I'm not saying it's just because of that one interface. But if you look around carefully enough, you'll see the results of flooding. You'll see the results of animals actually saying, hey, I've really had enough of this whole technique. So I think one of the things that we need to do is is be aware when we look at these situations and think about at least them as a prompt for shaping how we want to approach relationships with animals and taking whatever opportunities emerge to talk with people in lucid and respectful ways about the techniques available. One of my friends is boar goat, a breeder 
and rearer and she exhibits boar goats and I was looking at the way they were dealing with them in the show ring and seriously it was just a whole lot of caprine chaos in that ring there were just goats all over the shop they're trying to be led trying to be cosseted with sticks all sorts of stuff and I said to her have you ever thought about just training to your hand as a target away from this antecedent arrangement and then setting up something similar to it at home and getting the goat just to move towards your closed fist and leading it that way and we're supplying reinforcement for that event and even if you couldn't do that i.e the supplying of the reinforcement in the ring quite possibly the power of having set up that hand as a really potent secondary reinforcer may well be enough to get that animal to do that behavior beautifully for the short period of time that it's in the ring these concepts take some promotion and some follow through and i think you have to have a really strong and charismatic case for actually seeing how effective it could be. I'm yet to have that opportunity. One of the things that I'm also really concerned about in these situations is that on the extreme end of the scale, we have uh, the ability to absolve ourselves of any responsibility, even in the face of clear pain or distress indicators from an animal. And I, I did have a fairly spicy conversation with an alpaca person when I was watching an alpaca shearing display. And the guy on the mic was saying, now they might, you know, scream and kick for a while, but they soon settle down and they don't mind it. And I was with my mate and I said, how can that possibly be that we can say to ourselves in the face of that kind of extreme physical indicator from the animal that they don't mind it when it's clear that what happens eventually is that the animal just enters that state of learned helplessness on from that flooding. And a woman was in the audience nearby who really was prepared to take me on about it. And I just realized at that moment how complicit people are in that culture. And I just think that there is... A a gentle call to encourage us all to experiment with getting that animal to move towards rather than necessarily bringing it into direct coercion to get the cooperation that we seek. I guess for many people, those reinforcement techniques don't feel as available as just getting the animal to comply through coercion because you've got to make the time to actually do them. But imagine the welfare benefits and imagine the way your animal would regard you because most of the time you've taken that time to keep it in that high dopamine or oxytocin state through meeting its seeking system. I just think there's lots and lots of ways in which we can address this in the way we handle domestic animals and get much better performance. Do you remember seeing one of my examples when we were doing behavior techs in Wellington of the young woman doing the obstacle course with a rabbit at the Royal Show. And the only way she had figured out to get the rabbit to move was to just give it a tap on the bum. And of course, the rabbit would do it, but only as much as it needed to do to avoid that stimulus in the first instance. And we know from positive reinforcement that one of the great things about it is that it actually shapes amazingly forward learners who are really keen to interact with the environment. Just would have loved to have got hold hold of that situation and said, hey, can I have a look at training this rabbit to move on cue towards a target or some such thing and see what quality of behavior we could get as a result of that. So many examples abound. And I think there's a really great spot here for some worthy discussion on this area. Yeah. And thank you for engaging in that conversation. It's one that is really important, I think, to have. And I think you're such a great person to to engage in it in, in a way that is diplomatic and that has the patience that is required to to move forward in that space with those conversations so thank you very much for for answering that Nick let's travel now to the red center and some of your experiences whilst working at Alice Springs Desert Park there's two stories that I would love for you to share I mean I think the audience would really benefit from and they are of training a willy wagtail and you might have to explain to our non-Australian <laughs> listeners what a willy wagtail is <laughs> uh, from scratch <laughs> <laughs> and also of your absolutely fantastic story of Theo, the whistling kite. Yeah, there were two really great learning opportunities that stand out in my mind, and you've named both of them. Uh, the willy wagtail is a small songbird here in Australia, and it's held in great affection by great many people because it's one of the very few birds that have said yes to the changes humans have made to the landscape. It's a wagtail, so it's got a long tail that's often very busy, serving the bird as it twitches backwards and forwards, flushing out insects with uh, with 
flicks of its wings and it's rather charmingly called flirting this action by the ornithological community black above and white below and when i was working at desert park i was fortunate enough to live on site and i noticed that this willy wagtail hung around the back of the house and chased into the sliding door of my bedroom and the sliding door of the lounge and it would often just go on these foraging ventures and check out all of the spider webs around the back part of the house to see if there was anything in there that it could get for itself i thought god this is a wild bird i wonder if i could actually develop a relationship with this animal using the principles of ABA. so i managed to get some mealworms and whenever that wagtail was around i just started flicking mealworms to it well of course mealworms being such a high value food they immediately became a source of great traction and the wagtail started to move really strongly towards me and it was a really interesting experience in shaping behavior in this completely wild bird and it really taught me a lot about the value of successive approximation and thinking about your increments and thinking about your antecedents because the way that i trained the bird to actually come to my hand was to set up a small table alongside which i placed a chair and then got the plastic lid of a container and blue tacked it to the table and in Initially, what I did was not have that lid on the table. And the wagtail was so confident by this stage about me as a source of high protein wriggly worm goodness that it would jump up on the table next to me and I would just flick at the mealworm for doing that. So that was relatively easy. But then I started to do a little bit of zoning and I made it that the wagtail had to actually go onto that plastic lid in order to get that mealworm. That's the only place on that small table that that mealworm was going to be. And it caught onto that really quickly and of course in the first instance I set up that lid furthest away from me and then gradually just kept moving it towards me every time I was getting a high rate of confidence for that position I'd move it into the next one and then to actually train the hand because this lid was see-through what I did was that I just put my hand flat on the table and put the lid on my hand and then the bird would come onto the lid in close proximity to me seeing my hand through the lid so so then, as a corollary of that, it wasn't long before I could remove the lid and the bird would just hop onto my hand. And the relationship with this fabulous animal just developed to the extent that he brought his mate, who then learned the same technique. Then they bred and brought their young, who learned the same technique. So before I knew it, I had this whole Brady bunch of woolly wagtails hanging out the back of my place and would come and sit on the roof of a small patio wave room, which I had, you guessed, at some budget and would just wait there in the morning for me to come out and give him that food. Now, that said, I didn't do it every day because I also wanted to encourage natural foraging action in them. One of the most touching things that ever happened to me was sitting out the back of my house one reasonably mild afternoon just enjoying my yard, which was always full of birds. And I had my customary supply of mealworms right alongside me. And this bird, this willy wagtail, just came and sat on my foot. So I, I flicked him and milk and he completely ignored it and he sat on my foot for an entire 45 minutes or so without moving and ignoring all the reinforcers and then just took off so i was amazed to see this level of comfort with me not attached to the attaining of the usual reinforcer at the time of course science would say well it's because i've become a, a powerful secondary reinforcer and i was actually just naturalized as part of the animal's environment but i think in these relationships and in keeping with much of what i'm reading at the moment by authors like carl safina and franz de Waal, there is that sense that animals do have that uh, emotion scape inside and are able to identify emotions that go with positive experiences that have great outcomes for them. And I wonder if that was playing a role also. I remember one evening he was so keen, just on dusk, for one last feed before he went to roost that he came inside. And by that stage, it was far too dark to actually catch him up and send him out again. I had no desire to do that. So he flew into my adjacent bathroom and roosted up on the shower rail for the entire night. And then in the morning, I just got up and let him back out again for his breakfast and away he went. So it was a wonderful exercise in growing and developing with this little bird if you put that at the other end of the scale was this amazing whistling kite uh, with which we worked at uh, desert park name was theo total character and we were having some issues with getting theo to come in at the end of his segment in the show and i was working with two women who i really loved working with uh, melissa lees who currently works at currumbin wildlife 
and also then the amazing Mid Mary, who's an incredible woman and a really great trainer, both of them really into positive reinforcement techniques. And we were having this conversation where we were really trying to nut out what it was that we needed to do to get this bird to come home. And Mel was saying, you know, but the other day, you know, I offered him the whole ass of a rat and he didn't want to come in for it. And at that moment, I just thought... Right. If he doesn't want to come in for that, then there's obviously something going on that we need to address. So we started to talk about it and I said, guys, we're not really paying much attention to behavior here. We're so wed to the idea that this big hunk of what we perceive to be positive reinforcement has got to have some degree of potency that we're not actually seeing what the animal is telling us by its behavior. And in this instance, we knew that there were a couple of other whistling kites in the district at that moment. There was some roadkill down on Larapin to drive and of course whistling kites are consummate scavengers basically he's saying guys the environment is so much more reinforcing to me my ability to be out here means more than going home for what you're offering so we devised a plan and the plan was that we would work him in show and we would give him just one three second window of opportunity to come in from his tree that he would customarily perch on prior to coming down to glove and we said if he doesn't then we just continue to modify the show and deal with the situation until we get the behavior of target but here's the rub it wasn't so much that one three second window of opportunity it was really what happened after that because we then agreed that we'd get him down to his muse and we'd pay him a high value pay and then here's the thing we would give him the opportunity to get back on glove and go straight back out again using as the absolute positive reinforcement we theorized access to the environment so we set about doing this i remember it as one of the great really salient lessons of my life working with animals so far the day that he got that three second opportunity came down to glove i took him downstairs gave him a good hunk of pay, also a handful of mealworms. And once he'd finished the lot, he just stood there and looked at me in that wonderful, gawky, sharp-eyed ways that these whistling kites have. And I offered him the glove. He flew back up and I took him outside and he took off again. I thought, excellent. Next time he did that same thing. He did that getting back up on my glove and I took him to his launching spot and he just sat there and looked at me. So I took him back to his muse, put him back for reinforcement and he went in. So once we all practiced that and he got that we weren't going to take away necessarily the thing that he most wanted that was most reinforcing in the environment, the degree of cooperation that we were able to get in the future from this bird dramatically improved. Hey guys, I hope you are enjoying the podcast recording so far. This is part of what is a two-part series talking to the wonderful Nick Bishop. I hope you are all enjoying listening to it as much as we are enjoying making it. There have been so many great takeaways already from this episode. I'm super excited to continue on with it next week where we will talk about Nick's experience with a bull elephant in Kenya, what we can learn about animal training and behavior by watching animals in their wild state, learn about a joint venture Nick has set up called Behavior Techs, and hear Nick's thoughts and feelings about what he would like to see happen in the next five to ten years with positive reinforcement animal training so stay tuned before we wrap up today i just want to mention one really cool area of the animal training academy website animaltrainingacademy.com that is developing rapidly and that is the forums there's some really cool stuff going on in there and we're starting to get some great case studies of various behaviors being trained with a large amount of different species. I'm in there every day and it's a great way to connect with other ATA members and ask your personal questions about your individual training projects. One of the best ways to get access to the forums and learn more is by attending one of our live web classes. These are a lot of fun and in the live web class we cover the six essential ingredients to effective behavior management of your animals. We cover a simple three-step process for success that anyone can implement and helps develop your skill set fast and we also showcase proven results using a method that is unique to Animal Training Academy. So if you want to learn more about this then head over to animaltrainingacademy.com and hit the webinar button in the main menu and this will give you information about the next event. Just click on the link and then check the dates and times. And there's also a tool on the registration page where you can convert the web class into your own time zone as well. So it's really simple. Just select where you live and it will tell you the exact time in your location. And I'll see you live at one of our web classes. I also stay in those web classes for as long as need be. 
to make sure I answer everyone's questions and dive deep into personal training challenges. For now though, that's it from this episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here with us today. If you liked the episode, or if you didn't like the episode, please leave a comment on animaltrainingacademy.com. Tell us what you want to learn about, who you want me to get on the show, and what your favorite thing about positive reinforcement animal training is. Absolutely anything at all, we just love to hear from you. And thanks everyone for your comments you've already given me as well. I take them all on board and into consideration when moving forward with the show. We'll be back in your eardrums shortly. For now though, I'll say farewell. Farewell.